I develop Android, but I use it as, a, as an example, but you can translate that to any other open source projects that you do. First, a couple of words about me. Um, I'm Benjamin Weiss, or Ben, and I do many things around Android here in Berlin. I am one of the co-organizers of the DevFest here, uh, one of the organizers of the GDG Berlin Android, and um, author of a library that became pretty popular for Android developers called Crouton. Um, and there are some things why it became popular. It became popular on one hand um, because it was needed, and on the other hand because it's easy to use. Not every library can do that, not every library is easy to use, but um, I'll cover all this uh, within the session. So first of all, I'll go through a little bit what actually is open source, not the um, installment approach, so not the license approach, and nothing else like this. I'm not a lawyer, um, and, but I'm an enthusiast. I like working with open source projects. I try to improve if I can. I try to work with them, I try to use them, and I prefer open source software to anything that is uh, too closed. Yeah, using a Mac, of course. Um, but this is from company, and uh, the other ones from the company weren't uh, with Unix or something that had a proper command line, so I chose this one. Um, then, after I'll tell you what, what actually is the open source thing, <coughs> I'll go through um, the way to success and then how to get started and what's the best ways to get started with open source development. Mm -hmm. The last part is a little bit more about Android than the other parts, but like I said, it could be helpful um, keeping that in mind and going the same approach if you're not into Android development. So first of all, what is open source? Um, Open source is, of course, um, software where you can read the source code, and not only that, but it is proper licensed. But there's more to that. It's about choice. You can choose what you want. You can choose your software. You can choose if you want to use this implementation or that. You can choose to change what you, what you have. You can choose to fix bugs. You can choose to do anything that you want with it, depending on the license, of course. It's about freedom, not as in free beer, but as in free software. Um, the freedom we have to use open source um, and to make it uh, improve it and to make it better. And everybody of us, everybody who's able to code has this freedom to do that, which is one of the major benefits of open source software to compare to, to the closed source world. Also, it's chaotic, which is not a bad thing, but is not a good thing either. It is just chaos. <coughs> there has to have to be maintainers of software, there have to be maintainers that actually um, take care of the project so that the chaos is not just getting bigger and bigger, but that you get some structure. Um, if you do an open source project, it's pretty sure that if it starts to succeed that there will be pull requests pull requests, um, anybody doesn't know what this is? Great. Yeah, one hand, okay. That's, uh, no, just go just short into that. Uh, pull request is if somebody implemented something for your application or library and want, has improved that something or made something new, fixed a bug or whatever, and wants you to merge this into the main project. This is basically what a pull request is. Um, but there has to be the maintainer to actually decide whether or not um, this pull request is not good enough, that's a bad thing. Uh, it's, if it is um, within the standards of the application or library and within the, um, the goals of the, 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 the project. And they are a really good thing um, if they are, happen to meet the standards because they uh, improve the software, improve, improve the project and make it make it a lot better over time. Which does not mean that doing something open source uh, automatically gives you contributors and people that do stuff for you. Also, it's very diverse, because if you don't accept the pull request, then they just say, uh, fork you. Or actually, they just fork the project and create a new one out of that. And can be better than the old one. Happened to several projects. Um, happens in good ways, in very good ways, but mainly it's um, that the forks 
if there is a fork that is publicly announced that they succeed. So one of the, the recent I have in mind is the Hudson Jenkins fork. Who of you uh, knows what those are? Who of you uh, uses Hudson? Who uses Jenkins? So um, yeah, way more people using Jenkins. It's the fork of Hudson. Hudson has gone into new hands and is now more or less closed, as far as I, if I remember correct. Feel free to correct me on that. Um, and Jenkins is open and can be used by anybody. This is why people use Jenkins. But there are other uh, reasons to, to fork something, and there can be real, it can be emerged. Um, it is a very very, like I said, diverse thing. Also, basically, Android is open source, not all parts of it, which is a pity, but most parts are open source. So you can easily build your own open source, uh, your own um, Android from scratch, actually from the source. Um, you, KitKat just got released, and there are already compiled builds in the wild. You can, could easily just start up your build machine and um, create your own Android flavor or your, your own ROM, as they call it, I don't like um, to follow that, it's more or less like with uh, Linux, it's a distribution of Android. And um, you can easily create those. This is why the core is open source and um, it takes a good machine, takes some, some practice to make it work, but once it works, you can get it to work. So you can get your KitKat, not only from over there, but you can get your, get your KitKats actually on your phone, or actually in your phone. So, um, if you want to succeed with an open source project, there are some things that you have to keep in mind. First of all, um, the rules to success is, um, they're re really simple. First of all, don't tell everything you know. Yes, there is a second rule. Um, on the way to success is, first of all, you have to choose a license. Choosing a license is not, the, not that easy, especially for people that are not perfect with um, English legalese. Legalese is a language that is used in many, uh, is a sub-language of many languages. We have it in Germany as well. Uh, I actually tried to read some licenses. I tried to get help from people that know legalese or English legalese, and it is a pain. There are people that have opinions on licenses and you have, can have favorites in licenses. There are generally some, some different parts, but I'll cover that later. Um, also, it's very important that you stick to the standards. You don't have to be uh, very strict to that, but try sticking to them, try to uh, enhance them if possible or if necessary, but um, don't go and roll your completely own thing if something's already there that you can use and enhance. Also, make examples because um, people, most people don't read the document, uh, documentation and if they do, they're more or less in the, oh, why didn't this work in the first place? Um, try to make examples, try to make uh, demos, try to um, make them available to, s to see how the project actually looks and feels in the real world. For a web, web application, this could be, uh, yes, there is this demo user that you can actually see stuff on and you can see how it behaves. Because if you start up, um, for example, if you create your own Jenkins, or if you uh, get your own instance of a Jenkins, then um, yeah, it's pretty empty. But you actually want to see what it can do. So you want to see several projects, several modules that it builds, and how they can depend on each other, and what the results can be. Or maybe some plugins that are already installed. So you want to see that. Um, you can do this for Android apps, of course. You create a demo application and upload it to the Play Store or wherever you want. Make it accessible as possible. So going to, to Android, um, it is licensed within the Apache license v2, which is very common for Android projects to be licensed under the same license because people basically don't have to think again if they want to use it. Um, they're already doing this with Android. And uh, if you want to do something with the GPL, um, it is a license that has its valid use cases, of course. But um, if you want to do, if you want people to use your your um, software with it, if, if you want them to be able to use it within a closed environment, then it's probably not possible to use a viral license, for example, the GPL or some other licenses that are uh, viral, because um, 
they actually force you to release the source code if you um, enhance, modify, or probably some of them also when you use the license, uh, library or uh, the, the soft part software. So I just listed the GPL, but there are some, some other uh, viral licenses. Um, I preferred the Apache V2, but people also say, yeah, let's go with the MIT, with the BSD, or LGPL, or Mozilla Public License, or some other license. You can find many of them here. Um, they all have their advantages and disadvantages. But if you use something within your project, um, just a short question, uh, who of you uses other components than they have written themselves within their applications? Who of you contributes the people that, uh, attributes the people that have written the software? Okay. So all the others that raised their hand in the first question, but not in the second, this is a karma minus. So um, try to attribute the people that do software. They do it in their spare time, maybe for a job, maybe for a living, or it doesn't matter when they do it or how they do it, but they did something that you use and that you should tell people about, yeah, I'm using this. Um, many licenses don't require this, but it is actually a very good thing to do because you feel you can say, yeah, I use this, and I'm, if you are actually shipping your software with it, then you should um, say, yeah, I'm proud that we use this and it's great that it works. So this, it gives a, bit, a little bit of better karma, karma if you um, do that. Stick to standards. Actually, there um, was no standard for using um, Maven for Android. There was a plugin that was contributed, and it's an open source plugin. But by now, the standard would be more this. You create your own uh, project with Gradle for Android. Uh, use the Android plugin and um, use this as the build system and try to get people that want to contribute to use this. And it's really easy to, to create or to build the software on a completely new machine with Gradle installed, because all the rest gets handled by Gradle, which is a great build tool. Um, who of you has not heard of Gradle yet? Okay, there is a session on Gradle later on. Um, no, it's, yeah, I don't know when it, when it is exactly, but it's on schedule. And um, Gradle is actually a great tool for, for Android developers. And not only that, uh, for, for many other use cases, but it's getting more and more important for, for Android developers as well. <coughs> Um, who of you does not know what Git is? Who of you knows? Okay, good. That's enough hands to, to not go into Git. Um, first of all, use version control. In general, use it for anything you can because it's great. Second, um, use tags. So. Um, Writing commit messages is not enough if you want to release software. Tell the people, this is this version, and this version has a change log. The change log can be put into the tag. If you have it in there, people know what, what has changed. It does not have to be um, a whole book, but it should be the essence of the most important commits that has been, uh, has been introduced, at least. It can be more. If there have been major changes, try to tell people as well. This is what... Um, makes it easier for them to, to apply changes and to decide whether they should upgrade or not. But don't blindly upgrade anything. On the other hand, if you use it, try to make it um, try to read through the, the, the logs um, or at least the, the tag that what has been has been placed there. Another thing about uh, sticking to standards, if you use Gradle or Maven, then um, your repository gets less cluttered. Many people that don't use these for Android they put their jars, so their libraries, within the libs folder, which is really cool, but you don't have a versioning. You can't really see which version was used, because if you use the support library, you just say it's a support library.jar. Yeah, uh, maybe it says support library 4, so for the version 4, uh, which does not mean it's the version 4, but it supports Android as low as platform level 4. Um, but you still don't know which version you used. And one day you're going to forget which version you used the last point you upgraded it. If you use, um, and also it covers your, your repository because it has some, uh, the file size is not that big, but it's not as little as just saying one line or two lines within your uh, within your build script. And telling it, get this dependency um, and just 
use it, do it during compilation. So this is very important as well. Stick to standards also means use some pu some public way to distribute your software. There is GitHub, there is Bitbucket, there is this thing called Google Code, and there is this thing called SourceForge. Um, I recently, no, not just recently, but people tend to say SourceForge is where open source projects are going to die. Um, the other ones are probably for open source projects that you don't want anybody contributing to. If you want contribution, uh, GitHub has been the best place, for me at least, and for several other projects, because they have great social features in there. Social features, but social features for um, software developers. So um, anybody can send pull requests. You are, have a high visibility. You've got the possibility, possibility to ask questions directly in lines of code. And um, they're, they're doing a great, great thing there. So try to use them. Also, tell people how to format code if you want pull requests. If you want people contributing, um, there are people that format their code with two spaces, others with two tabs. Others with uh, three spaces, no, no, four spaces, more common, others with four tabs. There have been uh, solutions to this problem by saying, you want two, you want four, let's take three. Uh, yeah, three looks really odd, it's, um, it's, but it's my personal opinion. But if you have a library, tell the people how they should format their code. At best, provide a formatter. This is not always possible and not always um, very very fun thing to create a formatter for your for every IDE because you probably prefer one of them and um, try to tell them at least there are two spaces the line width is this um, and how more or less the formatting should look you don't have to go into any de every detail because uh, member naming and something like that should be pretty obvious from the way you wrote the stuff already also if you create open source software try to upload it somewhere publicly not just as the source code, but the binaries or the bundles. Repo.american.org is a great place. It works with Maven, it works with Gradle, and probably um, you can configure Ivy to have it working. Um, if you upload it there, people can always find it. If, you, um, if the software is there, then it is automatically pulled by Maven, and within Gradle you just have to configure one line to say, use the Maven, reposi main, main, Maven repository. So people can download, not only if they use these, but they can also download it if they don't use uh, build, build tools. They can uh, get the software and get to work with it without having the hassle of compiling, compiling it themselves. Also, one good thing is you signed it. You compiled it, you tested it, you signed it. So they know this is not something, some weird thing that somebody built with some odd, odd functionality that they don't want. Uh, talking about tests. Do it. It makes one thing much, much more easier. Not just the life of um, developing and uh, reduces uh, bug fix releases, but also gives you one great thing, and that is if there's a pull request coming in, you run tests. If the tests fail, pull request can just be rejected and said, yep, tests fail, I don't take this. Please fix the tests first. This is general common sense, and as a professional software developer, you should always do this. And um, this is very important to to keep in mind that you uh, create tests also for open source projects and try to uh, keep them up to date. Also, um, when sticking to standards, this is uh, in this case just a naming thing. There has been this thing called Toast on Android. Um, Many of you that did Android development used it, probably some of you used it within uh, released versions. Um, it looks ugly, it feels ugly, but you can use something different. And uh, that's called croton, which is also bread. So you can make, out of a toast you can make croutons. Um, they are sauteed bread and they're really, they taste awesome and uh, actually the behavior for Android is um, a better one that is that the toast one is because it is stylable, it is themable, it sticks where it belongs. So, but keeping back to sticking to standards, that's pretty small. But if you make a toast on Android, you uh, say make text with a context, a char sequence, and an int. 
So you get the we provide the context in order to allow it to be drawn on the UI. Uh, you provide a char sequence because that's weaker than a string. You can provide a resource ID as well. And uh, then use the integer you provide for the duration, which is long or short. Crouton has a very similar um, API. You provide an activity because uh, the Crouton attaches itself to the activity. And uh, you provide a chart sequence, as, again, as the text you want to display. And you provide a style because it's not just long or short, but you can style it. Like I said, you can change the colors, you can change the height, you can change anything you want with that. Enhancing them. Yeah, um, who of you has written an Android application and forgot to write um, toast.show? Yeah, many. Uh, not that many, but we have. I have forgotten several times. I was like, why doesn't this show up? Okay, it doesn't show up because you uh, say show, you forgot it. You just made it, you hit your semicolon and fire forget, everything's fine. Why doesn't this toast show up? Especially if it's in a live thing and the toast doesn't show up, it's missing user feedback, which is a bad thing. But if you're debugging, then it's going to drive you crazy. So enhancing the standard is, um, for example, if you have this make text method, which is the standard for toast. So I took this for crouton and made the make text and the show. But um, you can easily just say show because it's both. Actually, if I want to create something that I want to show in the UI, probably I want to show it directly. I don't want to make another method call, even if it's possible to chain it. So this is part of the enhancement. Also, um, because of Crouton, is possible, it's possible to not only attach it to an activity, but to any view group. You can easily attach it to a view group. But why didn't I put the view group further in front? Because it's easy for the, for the SDK, uh, for, the, for the IDEs to have auto-completion. And if you have the auto-completion, you just say, I want to um, show a group, a, a crouton, and it shows any method that has the same group of parameters. <coughs> so um, you see this one, if you go to auto-completion, and you just add another comma and add the view group. You don't all, always want this, so this is the, the least parameter that you will use. It has the least frequency of usage. So um, put it to the end. Try to keep all the important stuff in front. So this is actually what it looks like with um, different styles. And you can put it, for example, down here uh, or to any other view group. If you've seen a toast, the grayish text method message that gets shown on a, uh, somewhere at some point in time, um, it doesn't have to even have to be within your activity anymore uh, or within your application. It's way out of context. So this sticks to context. This is what the enhancement is about. So I'll just, yeah, that's just the example. You can download it if you want to. You don't have to. Um, make examples. Make the people use them and try and see it for themselves. So they will see this and they see, ah, oh, it looks nice. Or they say, no, I don't need this. Um, let's just continue with, with uh, daily work, with daily business. Yeah, keep it consistent. Try not to change the API all the time. There are valid changes of APIs. They are there, they are very important, they are important to keep it clean because projects grow. And there might be some things that you don't consider in the first place. But try not to break everything, try not to change every, everything, but change the stuff that has, really has to be changed. And tell people about it. Tell that this has been changed because it's now way more awesome. If it is way more awesome. If you just can't tell them, keep it on the space with that, don't change it. Another thing is um, don't force creating an open source library. Don't force uh, anything with coding because then it's going to be shit. It's like farting. Don't force it. Um, if it happens that an open source project becomes successful, it happens, but not because you want it to. Because people see that it is, has to be done that they want, it, want to use it and they, uh, they enhance it and they do stuff there. <coughs> it's easier for an open source project to become successful in the first case if it is needed and if it, if it more or less sticks to the standards. I've been talking about pull requests earlier, so um, we can skip on that. 
Also, if you want to get started, take a look around. Look what's there. And try to, to see the need of new projects. Try to see if there is something that you're looking for. If there's something that you need within your daily work and you wrote it for the nth time, try to create an open source component out of it, you can reuse it. It's good at least for you. Also, if it's open source, it's not just good for you within your current workplace, but within further workplaces. And I know many of us will, within their lives, change their jobs at least once again, if not all of us. So um, try to make it, try to, to reduce the workload for yourself and try to write it once, write it in a good way, and write it in a way that you probably can reuse it in the future. For getting started again, taking a look around is um, if you want to do something with Android, you go to GitHub and you search for Android. Um, there are open source projects. Can I have a guess on how many open source projects there are if you search this? 5,000, 10,000 something? No? Okay. It actually is about 60,000 repositories that have Android. Uh, code in them, which is a lot. So if you don't know where to get started, um, and if you don't know how to write um, proper documentation, how to write a, a good readme, take a look around. There are several projects that um, have done it right. There are projects that have done it better than I did, of course. There are projects that have done it worse. But try to make it good. Don't try to overcomplicate it. Try to keep it maintainable also the documentation, as well as, of course, your code. Also try uh, to release as early as possible. Who of you has heard of Git Flow? Okay, quite a few. Git Flow is um, a model on how to create your own, uh, how to, to branch. So you've got your master branch that's always stable. You have only releases on the master branch. Next to that, you have a develop branch. The develop branch is feature complete but not fully merged to master because it's not a release yet. But in theory, you could always take a, re take a release directly from the de develop branch if, you, if it's merged to the master. And you have your feature branches. So if you're working on a new feature, say uh, migration from Maven to Gradle, create a feature branch. Work on this feature branch and then bring it back to the develop branch. Try to not only bring this, um, if you're using this model, try not only say, yeah, uh, I do this for myself, but try also to tell them, Tell people that might want to contribute, please use the develop branch. Don't use master because this might be not the, the current state of uh, the, the future, future release. And release as often as you can and as often as possible. Try to push, not every commit, but if, a, if something is complete, push it. Release it back to the, to the open source community. Some people might actually want to work with that. Some people that are working on pull requests might have to, to merge it. So um, don't do anything on just one machine. This on, not only helps you with, um, with people around you, but it also helps you if you release your software. It is out there in the internet. If your machine crashes and this happens, hard drives tend to crash sooner or later. SSDs tend to crash sooner or later. And uh, backups are this, if you ever get this, this feeling, this cold feeling that gets up your spine if you think about backups. If you have this, do backups. If you say, yeah, I'm fine, I'm all settled, then you're probably already doing backups. If you don't do backups, yeah, you, you will find out why backups are good sooner or later. So um, I'm a little bit in front of time, but um, that's probably basically what I have to say about um, open source development for today. Are there any questions? Yes, please. Yeah. Hi, Ben. Um, Hi, you. Hi. Uh, what's your take on uh, introducing a new feature that means that you're deprecating some old functionality? Do you do you make it deprecated and stick it in the same release, and the next release it will be gone, or you should deprecate it? Deprecation just means you don't support it anymore. Um, you shouldn't just take it out immediately, because that's a radical API change that is not necessary. Um, removing it 
one, two, or even ten releases later, uh, depends on how people still use it. You could, for example, just say, yeah, if anybody still uses this, uh, please contact me, and if you don't get anybody contacting you, then you can probably just remove it. But um, try to keep, keep the deprecated stuff in there for a little while. If it starts to hurt, then it's probably time to remove it, but if it does not hurt to still have it in there, that's all right. And I guess with, for example, if you use Gradle, you could create your own um, a task that removes deprecated stuff, so the code gets removed, for, so people can compile it without deprecated. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Ben, again, what, what type of versioning systems would you recommend in terms of uh, version numbers? Let's say, for instance, uh, semantic versioning or these type of things. So you mean uh, like Windows 3, Windows 3.1, Windows... Yeah. Okay. Um, do whatever you like. You can go from A to 3 to B to um, Gamma or whatever. You should keep it consistent so users can understand it. You should um, count from one number to another um, and not do strange jumps like Microsoft did. They did the 3.0, 3 3.1, 3.11. That was pretty good. Then there was uh, some gap in my memory right now. Then it was Windows 95, Windows ME, Windows 2000, uh, Windows XP, no, yeah, Windows XP, Windows Vista, Windows 8. Wait, uh, isn't it 3.1.1, 3. .1 .1, 3 uh, then 8, then 95? Uh, how should I order them? If you don't know how they came to be, you don't know. Um, but keeping it sane, like saying, okay, this is version 1, this is version 2, version 3, um, you don't have to increase it every time. You just want to make sure what to do, uh, what, what, what is the, the point. What's really great is to, um, of course, having the dots, so version one dot whatever. And I usually say version one is the first release that's public. Then version one dot one has new features, or maybe even just bug fixes, but I try to keep the second, second digit for uh, bug fix releases. So I guess Crouton is at 1.8.1, .1, so it's the first public version. After that, there have been eight Minorly, mm, yeah, eight new feature releases and one bug fix, bug fix release for the latest one. This is the way that I do this. But you, as, I, as I said, you can do this as any way you want. There is no um, no strict standard to do this. Just common practice. Thanks. More questions. Yeah, so uh, questions about licenses, uh, which one I prefer. Depending on, I've done a project with, uh, that is licensed within the GPL. Uh, three. Okay, I guess, sorry, um, uh, it's quite old. Um, nobody contributed to it, which is not a bad thing because it's, um, not designed for contribution, and nobody closed sourced it and tried to resell it, which is a good thing. But I wouldn't create this uh, as open source project anymore because the project itself is, yeah, it's great that it's open source and it's not designed as um, for contribution. So people that want to contribute, they just came and we designed it, within, we created it within a small group, and. Um, Actually, the code is not that that readable in this case, so this is why I wouldn't uh, create it as an open source project again. But if you want people to um, reuse your component, enhance it, and actually have the, the benefits of a community, I would go with non viral licenses. So, um, like I said, uh, MIT Apache license are general purpose licenses that are open source, that don't uh, enforce re-open re sourcing any, th any changes, which is um, good and bad. But if you want to make money out of it, um, maybe the GPL is a good thing because people have to re open source it again. But it, this is always it always depends on the project, of course. Um, but if you want to have contributions and if you want to have many people to contribute, 
best approach would be to, to go with a non-viral license. I have another question yeah. regarding uh, open source software and patent issues. Yeah. I would like to know if there are any thoughts on that. Because you may build some kind of software which is then open source yeah. on any of these type of licenses. Yeah. It may introduce some kind of innovation and at some point somebody else may issue a patent on that. Yeah, that's and my then art. The copy, the, the, you, can, you can take the code, use it, modify it according to a license, but still uh, the general idea some kind of uh, the general idea is still some kind of, uh, of uh, uh, subjected to some kind of patent issues from a third party. And my my question would be, if, if this is a topic, are there any cookbooks on that? Um, yeah, there are. There is uh, lots of information on the internet regarding patents and prior art. Prior art is a really cool thing because if somebody um, issues a patent after something has been implemented in the first place, you can fight against that. There is a huge movement against open source patents, uh, not open source, against software patents, and I really appreciate that software or the idea um, that generally is soft, it's not a software, it's patented. You, if you want to make money of software, you license it, and you um, people have to pay if they want to use it. Not everybody does, but this is the way that people make money from software. This works for open source as well. Um, but if people just make, um, try to, to patent something that you have done, then that's, it's not that uh, big of an issue, because if, you, if it has to go to court, it's going to be expensive, of course, but the chances of winning this, this case is pretty, are pretty high. If it's not something, it's just a matter of days or something, but if it's... A little more than that, then there's no big issue that you, that you are the person, if you had prior art, you are the person that uh, will go out of that in the, in the uh, winning party. At least that's the most, most cases that this happened. Or you could probably, on the other hand, sell it to the patent holder, which is not a good idea in my eyes. Yeah, yeah I, can, I, can both, uh, I can speak up, it's no problem. Um, one of the things we found out when using open source libraries in your own code is that you need uh, somehow know the structure of your license. For instance, if we have an Apache 2 and I use a license with, uh, I use a library that has, a, that holds a MIT license. Yeah. How is your opinion on, on combining those two? Um, generally there is a... There is a website, I don't have the URL already, but there is a website that uh, tells if the if com uh, licenses are compatible. And um, the MIT and the Apache license are compatible in this case that you can combine them within a, a closed source software project. I guess the MIT, as far as I understood it, is... Um, Higher. Closer. Um, y yeah, you can easily easier closed source uh, MIT stuff, so you don't have to attribute it. And uh, that's that's easier to do. And if you wanna don't want to read that much legally, go with the MIT because it's pretty easy and simple to understand. So, but there are licenses that are not compatible. Okay. Yes. Uh, regarding Crouton, uh, how much time or effort did it take you to develop this project, and how much time does it take you to be responsible to the community currently, and so on? If you mm -hmm. can quantify it somehow. Um, it took me about, the first version took me not that long, it was about two days. Um, the enhancements, I do them in my spare time as a hobby, so a lot. Um, I would say all overall it has consumed about two weeks of my life, which is fair enough because it's a cool project. and. Um, right now, I, I don't find time to properly maintain it, which is a bad thing. But I try to make it better and I try to improve my behavior on that. But what I have learned from that is absolutely worth two weeks of my lifetime. Because what you can learn if you have an open source project and people contributing, you learn how to deal with that. How to deal with not people that you see on an everyday basis within your uh, office, but how to deal with people that you have never seen. And how to say, wow, that's really great. 
or please reformat it, or sorry, I can't take, take this like this, and try not try to be a good person with that as well. So this is um, on the one hand it, it improves the skill of of writing software, on the other hand it improves the skills of being a good person in the internet. And as we know on the internet, everybody's a dog, so it's worth it. Yeah. Um, I just want, wanted to comment on the on the patent issue. Um, just heard it, and um, I'm involved in a startup in Germany, and we got huge problems with a patent troll in the U.S. So if you're interested in the whole topic, um, just come to me. I'm sitting over there, and I can tell like hours about patents and software patents in Germany, in the U.S., and in general. So um, if you're interested in that, just let's talk about that. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> Great. Thanks. So if you want to have more, have you have, if you have more questions on patents, um, this is the guy. Nice. He doesn't, he's, he's not on the bad side, I, I suppose. <laughs> like he just said, he's on the good side. So he's the one getting troll, which is a bad thing. So uh, thanks for your time. I hope you enjoyed it and enjoy the rest of the Zepfest. Next we have Steve from the DDG Brimham, uh, back to more cloud topic. Uh,